week long of wonderful presentations by artists from all around the United States. Um, Let There Be Art, Seven Days of Creation. Uh, it was also a virtual art show that we've hosted throughout the week and it's gonna be open for just one more week. But, but yeah, last Sunday we opened, we were very honored to open with Ruth Weisberg. We had Jeanette Cuban Oren present, um, David Moss the other day, Sonia Loya, um, just so many wonderful artists around the nation. And uh, yes, we have New Jersey, New York, people zooming in from all over. But um, yes, it's been a wonderful, wonderful week. And I thought, who better to close our program with the Dean of Photography, the, known as the Dean of uh, Jewish Photography, Bill Aaron, um, who's just been so wonderful and, and also not only agreed to present and be a part of, but has been a mentor and very helpful throughout this whole process. Um, now, I could just read his bio, but I thought it would be so much more nice to have someone who actually has a, rela a long-term relationship, a friendship with Rabbi Karen Fox to do the introduction instead. So I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Rabbi Fox. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And it's a pleasure to introduce Bill Aaron, who we were just schmoozing. We know since the Westward Free Minion days, uh, which would be the <laughs> late, uh, the, the 70s uh, in Westwood. And it was really a wonderful community where people gathered. Bill and Isa were part of the community and I was an undergraduate student and you were the graduate students, the professor types already. And it was uh, really where we became friends. But through, after I returned to Los Angeles, uh, after I finished rabbinic school, we lived in the neighborhood and our families and our children were really terrific friends. They played in each other's backyards, rooms and loved to run through uh, meaningful satyrs with wild abandon. So it is my pleasure to introduce Bill and Bill in many ways, you know, in my language, you're the rabbi, okay? You're the <laughs> rabbi of the Jewish photographers and have really set the tone over, uh, over 50 years of what it is to capture the American Jewish experience and the international Jewish experience. I think your, your photographs of the Soviet Union brought us into the experience of what it is that people were going through at that time in a way that we could not have imagined with words. I think your capturing of Cuba and the Jews in Cuba and their, both their poverty and the vitality of the community was, was uplifted through the photography and your many years of capturing uh, Jerusalem have expanded our notions of how do we look at the varieties of people that inhabit the sacred city Muslims, Jews, Christians, people of all colors and all nationalities coming together to, to have that sense of holy city. But I'm especially connected to you in some other ways through Shalom Yal, because um, Bill and my sister-in-law, Vicki Rikus Fox, traveled through the South to capture what was the, the Southern Jewish experience that at the time you went in the 70s, or I guess the 80s, it was beginning to, to reduce in number because many of the Jews who grew up there did not return. And the question is, what happened to those Southern Jewish communities? I think Shlom Yal captures the experience because you met the families. You talked with them in their farms, in their neighborhoods, in their stores. And I think that sense of personal experience captured who they are and what they contribute to the Southern life and to Jewish life. So Bill, that book stands out in so, so many ways. I know you've gone on to do many other things in terms of work with Holocaust survivors that captured their stories and their history, but also their resilience. What did it mean for them to come to America and have life here with the background and stories they had? Your art is throughout the world in a variety of museums. And if you Google Bill, you'll find 
He's in Los Angeles and New York and Jerusalem and Boston. He's in uh, works captured in books and in many people's homes. And in reality, uh, this universal story that you captured through New Beginnings, Surviving Cancer, opened your work to a whole other way of looking at life experience that required resiliency. So Bill, it's a pleasure to know you and to see your ongoing creativity. I think you always, whether or not the camera is there, you have the lens in front of you capturing the moment, especially the moments that are the energy between people. So I'm grateful. I'm grateful to know you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rabbi. Thank you, Karen. Um, I, I should have you introduce me always. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and uh, that was lovely. And thank you, Leah, um, for your tireless and relentless attention to detail um, and putting all this together. I'm, I'm in awe of how you did it. And I'd like to also thank you all for turning out. I'm touched that so many of my friends have, uh, have turned out here and I'm, I'm just delighted. Um, for now, I'd like to just talk and share with you some of the stories and images that I've collected over the years uh, in photographing Jewish communities uh, here uh, in the United States and in Israel for the most part. Uh, and uh, I'll start um, before I turn to the images of my first encounter with photography, which was when I was 10 years old. Uh, my mother took me, I grew up in Philadelphia. My mother took me to Atlantic City. And uh, there was, there's a long boardwalk for those of you that don't know in Atlantic City. And at one end was the hotels where we were staying. And the other end was something called Steel Pier which was a huge open air arcade. And uh, I was, those times were very different. So in the evening, I was just turned loose to wander around the, uh, on the boardwalk. And I got down to Steel Pier. I turned into it. And the first thing I came to was this huge roulette wheel. And for a nickel, a spin, you could take your chances. So I had a nickel, I put it down, this is, in indelible experience in my brain. I put it down on number 48, the roulette wheel spun, and lo and behold, it landed on 48. So the man looked at me, I'm 10 years old, and he goes to take down one of these giant stuffed teddy bears they had on the wall. And I said, no, 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 I don't want that. <laughs> I have my own teddy bear. And he says, well, what do you want? Kind of annoyed. And I looked around and in the corner was one Brownie Hawkeye camera kit. So I said, I want that. So he, I, he seemed hesitant, but I, I don't know what that was all about, but he gave it to me and I was excited. So I ran back down the length of the boardwalk to my mother and showed it to her. And that began a lifelong love of photography. I have no idea what made me pick that, but um, it, it sparked something, it touched something in me that lasted. And now we'll go to some of the work that I've done, if I can, there it is. <clears throat> the, uh, um, Leah? <laughs> I'm here. Hurting. <laughs> It's not turning? No, let me see if I need to do this. Ah, there we go, so I need to press that. Okay. Um, this is a doorway on the Lower East Side, which was the first place that I practiced and honed my photography skills. Some of you know I'm a career change. I did something else until 1974, when my wife and I moved from Los Angeles to New York City. And I was not kind of happy so I decided to take a year off from uh, doing anything. And during that year, I found that I could not not do anything. Um, and I, so I began photographing, which was always a love of mine and something I had 
followed not by practice, but by appreciation over the years. Um, and uh, I, at the end of the first year, I had gotten some pretty good feedback from people. At the end of the second year, I'd gotten better feedback. I picked up a museum which began, read, uh, not a museum, a gallery in Boston, the Pucker Gallery, which began uh, representing me in my work. And uh, I said, well, this is great. I'll try this for another year and see what happens. So after a while, it's not that you burn your bridges, but the bridges are no longer there. Uh, and so I've been doing it ever since. Uh, the, uh, when I was living in New York, Misha Avramov, who was a fellow New York Chavara member, which I'll, I'll talk about the Chavara later, introduced me to the Lower East Side and Project Ezra. Project Ezra was an organization devoted to helping the Jewish elderly poor in the area. A little bit of history of the Lower East Side. It was an important landmark in the life of the American Jew. It was one of the principal areas of settlement for Jews as they immigrated to this country. The first Jews came in 1650, and by the turn of the 19th century, it contained the largest Jewish community in the world. Um, <laughs> this is a, these are Holocaust survivors uh, that I found on the park bench walking around, and I began talking to them as my want, found out a little bit about them, and then asked if I could photograph them. And the husband leaned over to his wife and he said, here, catch this. And I said, no, no, wait, wait, wait. Well, I was, it was a very hot day and I was, my thought glasses were steaming up and I was struggling to focus the camera and we finally survived that encounter. Um, also, uh, just to continue about the Lower East Side, it was a source of a variety of Jewish cultural institutions, Yeshivot synagogues, Yiddish newspapers and theaters, as well as the restaurants and coffee houses depicted in the stories of Isaac Besheva Singer. The whole range of Jewish life could be found from the pious Hasidim to the socialist Bundes, from the artists and scholars to the entrepreneurs. Usually after I finish uh, a job, I'll roll the film, whatever's left of the film in the camera. Um, these are, of course, you all know that this is pre-digital era. I would roll up the rest of the film, put it in a canister and put it safely in my camera bag. For some reason on this particular job, I did not do that. So I went, there was one frame left um, and I walked, went to this down in the subway and I looked across the platform and saw this Hasidic gentleman and he was actually facing me and standing closer to this edge of the platform. And I took out my camera and by the time I got it out and up to my face, he had turned away and I'm thinking, oh, he just doesn't want to be photographed. Um, but in fact, he had heard the subway coming and he was ready to get on. And at that instant, the Hispanic gentleman on the left walked into the frame and the subway pulled up and you see the, what looked like to me, bored office workers looking out the window. Rabbi Eisenbach was a very special person on Lower East Side. He, uh, scribes in this country couldn't compete with the Israeli scribes uh, economically. So most of them would fix used Torah scrolls. I would, I was on the Lower East Side working for Project Ezra several days a week. And I would go in whenever I passed his shop and talk to him and he always answered my questions. Uh, one particular afternoon, I was giving a tour of the Lower East Side to a youth group from the Upper East Side, the wealthier parts of uh, Manhattan. And I was standing in the doorway. It's a very narrow street. It was a very hot day. Uh, and uh, I was explaining to the youth group outside what I had learned about a scribe and recipes for ink and his lifestyle when I saw the picture I wanted to take. And he had consistently refu refused and not allowed me to photograph him. So I raised my, seized the opportunity and I took the photograph and 
it was the loudest click of my camera I've ever heard before or since. Uh, and I have, and he looked at me when he heard the click, he looked at over the top of his glasses like this. And you can all guess, I ran away with the youth group on to the next place. About a week later, I showed up with a print and I showed it to him and he said, very nice, thank you. And his son looked at it and said, asked me to, who was a, his son was apprenticing at the time and said, please here, take my picture too. I don't know about y'all, but the uh, second from our left, the uh, boy on the tr uh, tricycle looks a lot like Spanky to me, and the rest of them look like Spanky and our gang. You know, I'm really not used to giving these talks without hearing the feedback of laughter or lack of laughter, so it feels very weird to me. Rabbi Reinman, I met him at a Talis factory on Lower East Side, it was the Munkach Talis factory, started from people from the town of Munkach, which was uh, Poland. Um, and I was, I, it's a wonderful face, and I was trying to figure out how to photograph him without lifting my camera and scaring him away. So I was looking down at my camera, adjusting the focus, the distance, and the f-stops, the light, and finally he leans over to me and says, hurry up and take my picture, I have to leave. So I learned, I became, we, we actually, he was a bookseller and, and we actually became friendly and I learned from him that it's not the commandment against graven images that Orthodox adhere to when they don't want their picture taken. It's more a, uh, what they consider the sin of vanity. They don't want to pose, but uh, obviously not all Orthodox are like that. Um, Bill, I just yeah. want to mention to you, you're on cue, even though you can't hear the laughter where you thought laughter was happening, it was happening. I just, <laughs> okay. I just wanted you to know that. Thanks. I saw your and Karen's laughter, so <laughs> I felt a little reassured. Okay, good. <laughs> um, a, a fish bargaining session on the Lower East Side. I have always wondered when this uh, print has, uh, this photograph has been exhibited, I've always wanted to smear some mackerel on the uh, frame so people would get the full experience of being there. Um, I, the credit for the, my caption for this goes to another fellow New York Havara member, Zev Schenken. It says, you all know the painting, the American Gothic. Well, this is my version of the American Jewish Gothic. Um, and Zev was the one that suggested that to me. When Arafat came to the UN, there was a big demonstration in a uh, plaza near the UN. And I could not get press credentials to get up on the stage and you know, photograph there where all the other photographers were. So I went or found a building which was open. There are fairly tall buildings that uh, encompassed the square. I went up to the, I couldn't do this today, obviously, but I went up to the roof and looked down and all I saw at first glance were the leaves of the trees. Uh, I don't know if it's big enough on your screen to see that, but- um, Yes, we can figured, see it. I, I figured they had all left. And I then I started to notice the people through the trees. And actually this, uh, rather than the, uh, images I would have gotten had I been on the podium with the speakers. This was fairly widely used in the reporting of on the demonstration. Uh, the New York Havara, I have actually always felt privileged to have belonged to this group. It emphasized the aesthetics of prayer as it relates, aesthetics as it related to prayer. And I think they, I was allowed to photograph on Yontif on holidays, I think because of this emphasis on the aesthetics. Um, we were not affiliated with any synagogue or any particular movement, and we rented an apartment for our meetings, prayer, and study. Once a month, we would leave the city for a Shabbat or a holiday retreat. The image uh, here is of a um, one of, after a, sh we, 
We left the city for the holiday of Shavuot. And after an all night study session, we went out to the porch of the building we were staying in uh, to say morning prayers. And this particular fellow, Danny Shevitz, uh, wandered away from the group. And I, of course, followed him. I was asked to do an illustration of uh, the Havara for a story that uh, the newspaper was doing on the New York Havara. And uh, I came up with this image from one of the members during, two of the members during a, uh, Shavuot, uh, during a Sukkot retreat. This was taken in uh, Nyack, New York um, at the Camp Ramah. Uh, when we had gone there for a weekend uh, for one of our Shabbat retreats. Judy Samuels, who is with us today, um, the group, the Chavara, although observant, um, was totally egalitarian, allow, allowing women to assume all the roles uh, of Judaism, uh, especially, you know, obviously the roles that were previously assigned only to men. Uh, and this is, was taken during uh, uh, Simchat Torah. Levi Kelman and Judith Rosenbaum during a uh, Sukkot retreat uh, during Hakafot when we were walking around uh, in the uh, morning prayers. Um, we were attempting to put up a sukkah. Not that we were all that handy, but there was a strong, there, uh, we have to give credit where credit's due, there was a strong wind that day, so it made it extra difficult. And, and that's Levy Kelman uh, on the right, laughing and um, gesticulating as to my taking the photograph at this particular point. Jay Greenspan, um, reading Torah to a number of families, the uh, members, some members of the Chavara, my wife uh, included, Isa Aaron, um, started a parent-teacher cooperative Shabbat school for the families in the neighborhood after they came to the Chavara and said they didn't want to join a synagogue, but they did want to do something about a Jewish education for their children. Like, the, like our sukkah building skills, we had some issues to work on uh, with our volleyball session. At the baby naming of Sara Meyerowitz, uh, who I believe was the first child born to parents while belonging to the Chavara, um, we also would get together to celebrate with each other life cycle events, and this was at her baby naming. And the members of the group in the year 2000, where we held a retreat and uh, everybody brought their children and uh, we had a great time. So there are, I could, I could just use Chavara pictures for this whole talk. Um, there's just because they all have uh, a special meaning for me at a very formative time in my career that I took at a very formative time. The former Soviet Union. Uh, I, thanks to Havia Shenland, who was the then director of the Jewish Federation's Commission on Soviet Jewry, I traveled to the Soviet Union in the fall of 1981. We visited three cities, Leningrad, Minsk, and Moscow. Um, when we arrived, we arrived the day before Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur, the day before actually Kol Nidre, and uh, a refusenik uh, from the Soviet Union met us at our hotel and took us to the synagogue for uh, services. I walked in and walked up to the women's section and sat down next to this woman and figured, oh, what a great photograph to, to start with. So I bent and lifted my camera, at, started to lift my camera out of my camera bag when I froze. I had been so concerned about whether I would get into the Soviet Union with all my camera equipment and lenses and film 
that uh, I hadn't stopped to consider that I'd be photographing on one of the holiest days of the year or some of the holiest days. So uh, when I did, when I started photographing, there was some commotion, but it wasn't until after services when I was leaving that someone came up to me and told me not to worry if uh, people seemed disturbed, nobody would bother me uh, taking fo making photographs um, because they knew I was taking them back to America uh, to help them out. This is my three wise men of Minsk during Sukkot services in the Minsk synagogue. Um, we're not going to see it very well. Um, sure. The man leading the services had been a Hebrew teacher in Minsk. He would sit in the synagogue and anyone who wanted to learn Hebrew or practice the Hebrew they do would come to synagogue and they would sit and work with him or he would work with them. Uh, one particular uh, day um, about, I think it was about a year before we had been there, we were there, um, the KGB showed up and took him down to their headquarters and detained him overnight. When he came back, he never spoke about what had happened to him, but he also never taught another Hebrew lesson. And when he chanted the Hallel, there was not a single sound except that of his voice and all eyes were just riveted on him. And I could see that, um, I learned the story afterwards, but I could see that during the moment that this was a very emotional uh, experience for everyone there. Arkhipova Street, Simchat Torah in Moscow was really an unforgettable experience. We arrived early and already there were some 3,000 people in the street. We made our way inside the synagogue and upstairs with some difficulty. When we returned outside, we found about 20,000 Jews packed from one end of Arkhipova Street to the other, with Kate, which was remarkable given that the KGB was lined shoulder to shoulder along the fence in the background uh, of the uh, other side of the crowd. Uh, Richie Siegel, I have to confess, Richie Siegel, who was the creator of the, and co-author of the Jewish catalog books, was the first to see this image as evocative of a talit. The Jerusalem architecture I've always I've found to be amazing. Uh, every street and alley contained a potential photograph. And this alley cat lended a certain poignancy to this particular alley. The um, mix of cultures is evident uh, all over Israel but particularly in Jerusalem. The, photograph, the image was made at about 30th of a second, which allowed this man walking across uh, the frame to be blurred as he is. There's a white streak coming out, right, coming out of his head. And I had always assumed that was, for a long time, I assumed that was a flaw in the negative. So I would laboriously retouch it out on every print until I realized when I took a picture of somebody else with a cigarette and walking, that that was actually the tip of his cigarette which he was dragging on as he walked across. And the light, the fire from the, the flame of the tobacco made that, burn that white, um, uh, uh, streak into the film. Um, soldiers in Israel, and uh, particularly now, um, and it has increased over the years, um, are 
omnipresent. They're all, they're everywhere. And uh, this is in the old city uh, on the way, on the marketplace, on the way to the Western Wall. If you know the paintings of Shalom, Shalom of Sfat with his uh, terracing that he uses, um, he, I, I mean, I, when I gave, I, I understood his painting a lot better after I noticed how much terracing, terracing uh, there was in Israel for the farming. There's a special squadron of the Border Patrol. The Border Patrol is responsible for, um, um, for patrolling the old city uh, and the marketplace. And I've always uh, thought of these soldiers as belonging to the flirt squadron. And always wondered if that young lady near the center and the soldier on the left who's tilting his head, if they ever did get together. It seems they ought to have. Uh, this is from the Mount of Olives looking towards Jerusalem, a very uh, different landscape because this was taken in 1981. I'm sure the skyline right now is, is very different. Uh, several, years, um, several years ago, I came to understand that the profession of photography was drastically and permanently being altered. With the advent of new and better generations of digital cameras, anyone, it seemed, could make a commercial photograph. And I began to wonder if there was a place for me in photography. It was just at this time that I discovered uh, multi-image panoramas that's stitching together, for me, it was in Photoshop, or though there are program, other programs to do it, stitching together uh, numerous images taken over time. Um, uh, the concept of multi-image uh, panoramic images can, if done in a particular way, play with our image of time. As we ordinarily think about time, it's a truism that uh, time is transient. What we think of as a photograph is actually a photograph of the past as it was in the present when the photograph was taken. And as soon as we perceive the present, it's past. The present actually has no duration. So in these multi-image photographs, there's a group of people around the man with the yellow shirt. And you see them in the past walking through the image at different points in time. Uh, and uh, that to me became symbolic of the whole notion of past, present, and future. Although without the future, of course. Many philosophers of time don't believe in future. They say there is only present and past, and some philosophers believe there is only past. This is at a memorial in the north of Israel. It's the same concept. You see uh, various people as they're walking around the pool. This is a memorial to a helicopter accident in which a number of Israeli soldiers were killed when the helicopter crashed. How am I doing with time? Oh, good. You're doing well. Okay. Um, shalom, y'all. Um, I have to give a special thanks to Vicki Rikus Fox, without whom I never would have been introduced to the Deep South, which was Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, and Arkansas. And later, I added South Carolina to that. Um, Vicki called me up one day. She lives in my neighborhood, or at the time, she was living in my neighborhood in Los Angeles. And she called me uh, and said that a man named Macy Hart was visiting her and they'd like to come over and uh, talk to me. So I said, sure. 
they came over and Vicki introduced Macy as the director of the Henry S. Jacobs camp and the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience. Uh, Macy proposed this project of photographing over a number of trips, uh, the um, Jews of the Deep South. And I thought to myself, Jews of the Deep South, how long could that take? My first book took me 10 years to compile. This can't take very long. I also had no conception of the distances between uh, say Jackson, Mississippi and Little Rock, Arkansas, um, much to my later embarrassment. Well, 10 years later, we uh, came up with Shalom Yal. Um, the image on this book, uh, one of the places Vicki and I went in New Orleans was a Jewish community center. And we said, can we have two cute kids to photograph them with, with these two chalas? Because we were actually looking for, to make a poster at the time. And so she picked these twins from Odessa in the former Soviet Union. Uh, and we took them, we placed them, got the lights, set everything up, took the picture. And uh, after I, about a couple of weeks later, when I was back in Los Angeles, I got a phone call from uh, the mother of these twins saying, I had no right to photograph them. Um, and would I please not use the photograph anywhere? Um, and so I, uh, I liked the image, so I, but I, uh, of course, agreed to that. But then when we were compiling the book, at that time, I met a friend of that woman uh, through the, at Temple Isaiah, they used to have a Hanukkah art fair, and this woman came up to me there and said that she was, she knew the mother or the family that these two twins belong to. And I said, oh, I'd love to uh, get in touch with her. Can you give me contact, her contact? So she did. And I wrote to the mother and I said, um, I really like to use these pictures. I'm doing a book now. And uh, she called, I gave her my phone number and I said, I'd love to talk to you about this. So she called me up and she says, well, I don't know, but my two children, they really want you to use this book so you can have my permission. The reason that I originally objected was that we had just arrived recently from the Soviet Union and we were so used to government people um, looking in and make ta and following you and causing distress to you that we were worried about somebody we didn't know photographing our children. But anyway, we became sort of friendly and I sent the prints and uh, the kids are just delightful. In the fall, uh, no, I'm sorry, in the spring, just after planting of the cotton, I was visited this, what I called a farm and was corrected by Ben's, Ben Lamensdorf, the owner. He says, well, we don't really call it a farm. It's really a plantation. So, he had just planted his cotton. So I said, well, look, you know, I'd love to come back and photograph while the cotton is in full bloom. So he said, okay, and we found this place, which would be good. And um, I didn't really know much about cotton, but he set the date according to the farmer's almanac. But cotton is a very sensitive, time sensitive crop. So when, uh, the, the trip came, um, the cotton, either because there was too much rain or too little rain, the cotton um, came due before we arrived. So he had plowed all his fields except what was in line of this, uh, this particular window. And he, said, and he asked me not to open the shades any further. And I said, okay, so I did what I did. And when I had finished, I told the foreman and he radioed his guys in these huge mechanized cotton pickers that are, you know, like a two or three story house. He recognized them to go ahead. And by the time I bent down to put my camera in my camera bag, which was on the floor and stood up, this entire field had been cleared by these uh, mechanized cotton pickers, these huge machines. 
a little bit of the South. Um, Jews have resided in the American South since the early 1700s, which I didn't know. Many came directly to Southern seaports from Europe, still others after experiencing the crowded living conditions in the Eastern seaboard set out for the more sparsely populated areas of the South. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, their numbers swelled. This is Jo Eber and her uncle Meyer Gelman, taken at the last uh, Orthodox synagogue, now closed, in Mississippi. It was a Greenwood, Mississippi. Jo says, or he told me, I am reminded of the story about the governor of Mississippi speaking at the funeral of one of our members in the synagogue. He pounded his fist and remarked, there was never a finer Christian gentleman. Southerners, he explained, rarely connect Christian with being a Christ follower. It doesn't necessarily mean anything to refer to a good Jew as a Christian person. Most local people call our synagogue a church. Um, Mark Perler and uh, on the right and Elliot Coben. Mark is a uh, businessman in Tupelo, Mississippi. And he, uh, he told me, this is where our personal Judaism has flourished. You can't stand on the sidelines side here and watch it happen or it won't happen. Mark teaches in the uh, synagogue. He teaches in the synagogue Sunday school. Havdalah service at this Henry S. Jacobs camp. Um, I really can't overemphasize the importance of Macy Hart, the first director of the Henry S. Jacobs camp. As small towns in the South were dying, people came to Macy and asked what they should do with their Jewish artifacts. He then raised funds to establish the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience to collect and preserve their Torah scrolls their eternal lights and more. He also developed an extensive adult education program for families to attend during the year. After that, he raised funds for itinerant Jewish educators and rabbis to travel throughout the South and serve the small towns without those resources. Um, Ruben Greenberg, uh, who is the police chief in Charleston, South Carolina. He told me the story of his becoming Jewish. He had been born Jew Ruben Green. And during the free speech movement, he attended Berkeley University. And he was, uh, well, the, the civil rights, he was very active in the civil rights movement. And he always wondered why there were so many Jewish people at the meetings that he uh, that 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 he attended uh, for civil rights demonstrations. Um, so he began talking to a local rabbi. The uh, the discussions led to some study, and it led to his investigating his background, where he learned that there had been, and one of his, I think his great grandfather had been a Greenberg. And he eventually wound up converting to Judaism. And uh, he now belonged in Charleston. Uh, he changed his name from Green to Greenberg at that point, and then eventually became the police chief in Charleston, South Carolina. Terrific man. Lucille and Harold Hart of Eudora, Arkansas. This is a kind of long story, which I really need to read to you uh, about Lucille and Harold. Um, he was billed to me as the last Jew of Arkansas, or Eudora, Arkansas, and that I was to meet him at his liquor store in downtown Eudora. When we showed up, only uh, Harold was there, so we said, and eventually during the discussion, 
he said um, that uh, he talked about his wife a number of times. And I first I didn't want to say anything because maybe his wife wasn't alive anymore. But then as he continued, I said, well, where is she? So he said, oh, she's not Jewish. So I said, well, at any rate, we want to include her. And he mentioned during the conversation that they had been married 35 years ago by a Rabbi Sam Stone in Greenwood, Mississippi. And I knew that Rabbi Stone was a uh, Orthodox rabbi. And I said, I don't think that could have been Rabbi Stone who married you because I don't think an Orthodox rabbi would uh, perform an intermarriage. And he says, yeah, yeah, I can, pr I can prove it. Uh, come back to the house. So at his house, he, uh, Harold brought out a large manila envelope and said, it's in here. So I pulled out, what I pulled out was his marriage certificate, which was indeed signed by Rabbi Stone. And a folded up piece of paper also fell out of the envelope. And I began reading, Lucille so-and-so, whatever her maiden name was, has come before me and the house of Israel this day and has freely consented to join the people Israel. Join, yeah. Without thinking, I said, Lucille, you're Jewish. She hesitated for a split second then asked, can I be buried in a Jewish cemetery? I replied, of course, according to this, you're Jewish. After only a brief hesitation, she said, wonderful. And she and Harold began laughing and hugging each other. Apparently, for, I was able to piece together this, I think, what happened. Before their wedding ceremony, Rabbi Stone asked Lucille a number of questions about the Bible. Having had a good Christian upbringing, she answered them all at length. Afterwards, he turned to Harold and said, Harold, if you knew as much about the Bible as this young woman you are marrying, you would be a good Jew. He then asked Lucille if she would voluntarily accompany Harold to the synagogue. She answered that she had every intention of doing so. And then he, Rabbi Stone performed the ceremony. As I understand Jewish law, there are three requirements for conversion. Two of these are that the convert be Jewishly knowledgeable. Rabbi Stone quizzed her on the Bible, and so she was very knowledgeable. And that he or she is converting, secondly, of their own free will. And Lucille was going to go to synagogue with Harold. Uh, about the third uh, requirement, the attending of a mikvah, I'm not sure what uh, Rabbi Stone thought, but he uh, um, probably figured she had had a shower that morning. Michael Shackleton um, was uh, a Jewish shrimper. He came to New York, didn't like it there, was too crowded came south, wound up in New Orleans, uh, tried one or two businesses, each of which failed. And one day he's having lunch in a restaurant and he looked around and everybody was eating shrimp. So he thought I should do something with shrimp. So he became one of the largest shrimp wholesale um, people in, the, uh, in New Orleans. Bob Coleman. Uh, let me read a uh, story. In 1898, uh, uh, this is actually told to me by Bob Gartenberg of Hot Springs, Arkansas. In 1898, a Jewish acquaintance of my grandfather's walks into a store and says to him, you're not married. Would you like to be? My grandfather says, who would marry me? I'm just getting started and I don't have much. The other man says, I have a sister. Here, let me show you a picture. This is Carrie, isn't she beautiful? Indeed, she was very beautiful. So my grandfather says, okay. They travel to New Orleans and the man introduces my grandfather to Carrie. This is not the woman in the picture, my grandfather says. No, this is her sister. The woman in the picture is Lena, who is married and lives in Shreveport. Would you like to marry Carrie? She is single and available. My grandfather thinks, well, I have no other prospects, and I did come all the way to New Orleans. He says, okay, and they marry and have three children, and we're very happy. I think that worked out very good. 
This is formerly Congregation Bikur Cholim, which is now an Ace Hardware store. It's in Donaldsonville, Louisiana, um, a very small town. And we set up across the street uh, to photograph uh, uh, this building. And within about 15 minutes, every teenager in town learned that there was a photographer in the field across from the Ace Hardware store. So they began driving back and forth uh, along the, the street, and that's the white streaks are the lights of their cars going back and forth. Cotton makes the world go round, or I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Cotton makes the South go round. And this is some of the very uh, newly uh, blossoming uh, flower uh, cotton balls. Bill, just a heads up, we have about five more minutes until questions. Okay, then let me go on, tell one more story. This is from my, my study of Holocaust survivors, which I received a grant from Occidental College in 1939, from the 1939 club and Occidental College to photograph 100 survivors in Southern California. This is Vera and Siggy Hart. I asked him, uh, each of his whole family had survived the war, uh, everyone in a different place in Europe. And so I asked him why he thought it was possible to, um, that everybody would survive when so many people had perished. And he told me the story. When I was a small boy, my father told me this story about his father, my grandfather. My grandfather was working in the fields when a well-known rabbi was passing by. The rabbi's wagon became stuck in the mud and his followers could not get the wagon moving again. My grandfather saw the problem and went over to help. He was a very strong man working from the fields most of his life. He put his shoulder under the axle and lifted the carriage high enough so that the rabbi's followers were able to push it out of the mud. The rabbi then said to my grandfather, the way you helped me out of this wagon to take it out of the mud, so should you and your children and your children's children always be helped out, helped out of trouble. When he told me this story, I, mean, every, I shivered and I still get the goosebumps every time I read this story. Then I'll end with one more slide, which reads, this is from the Lower East Side, this reads in Hebrew, the Rebbe hat gemuft. And if you'd like to ask questions, I'm here. So, so Bill, first of all, that was just extraordinary. All of the Thank images you. you've taken over the years. And it's been interesting reading the comments in the sections, um, how you've documented every milestone of my adult life, how throughout the years and all our friends and how you, um, you know, my father just passed away. What, so someone, I'm going to read a specific comment. I hope that's okay. Um, they said you included my parents, Lou and Dorothy Shotland, survivors in your beautiful Holocaust tribute book. Um, my father just passed to, on at age 99, a remarkably, a remarkably resilient man, and you have helped us preserve and honor their legacies. Thank you so much. And you've done that for so many people, so many individuals, communities around the globe. And, you know, you, and not only that, you know, all the stories behind it as you've shared throughout this whole program. Um, so I do have, the way this is gonna work is I have a couple questions, but then I've also asked another, um, and I'm gonna stop sharing your screen if that's okay, Bill. I um, out how to do that. There we go. Um, we have another extraordinary artist with us today, Richard McBee, and he's been a part of our program. And I asked him if he would just share a bit about his work for just five minutes. Um, you guys have to meet him as well, and Bill's going to introduce him. But what what we're going to do is I'm going to ask you two to three questions, and then um, Richard, you're going to uh, sorry, Bill, you're going to introduce Richard, and then we're going to open it back up for any questions and comments. So. My first um, questions to you, the first question is, did anyone influence you to do all your wonderful photography? Um, I, I assume the question was meant, uh, which photographers um, have, or have been uh, 
influential in my development. Um, I, I, there, there have been several. Um, in the early days, um, I had gone through school and gotten a PhD in sociology. And when I trained, changed to photography, there was the option to um, go back to school for an MFA. Um, but I decided against that and just studied with people. Um, Philip Halsman was a great portrait photographer that, who influenced me greatly. Um, Cartier-Bresson, his photographs, which I came to know through exhibitions and books, um, taught me about the uh, importance of timing. Uh, Jay Maisel taught me about the importance of color, uh, even in black and white. Um, there are, Andre Cartes taught me about the uh, uh, concept and importance of design. So yeah, it, of course, um, I think as you grow within any profession, you stand on the heads of other people, you make their work your own and then develop it further. Okay. Next question is, why did you choose black and white exclusively? And when did you start also to use color? Well, I, I came of age in the, um, I came of age uh, during the heyday of black and white street photography. And uh, also in the 70s, color was not really that good color film. And uh, I just, I just liked it, so I continued with it um, until uh, my first color project was uh, the Holocaust survivors. And then I continued it in the cancer survivors because it seemed to me in the Holocaust stories, I was showing not the tattoos. Uh, when I was contacted, the concept that I proposed was to photograph what the survivors had done with the rest of their lives and how they grew out and um, established professions, uh, married, had children, uh, earned money, gave back to their communities and led, you know, in spite of the nightmares that they all had, they led productive and um, somewhat happy lives uh, within the limits of their experience. And it seemed to me that color best portrayed that. Wonderful. Well, what we're going to do real quick is, as mentioned, just we're going to, this is such a brief, only five minutes isn't enough time, but we're going to, um, Bill, if you'll just introduce Richard, uh, and then we'll open it back up to questions after we hear from Richard. Richard, okay. are you here? Maybe not. <laughs> Um, I am here. Oh, hi, hi Richard. Richard. Yes. <laughs> hi. Hi. Um, Richard is, is not only a wonderful artist, um, but uh, he's a very accomplished writer. Um, he uh, reviews shows and books and is a mentor to other young photographers. And he's just has a very open and warm personality uh, and is very approachable. Um, and I, I will pass along to him to explain how he wants to handle this time. Go ahead, Richard. Richard? Bill, Bill thank you so much. As you very, very well know, I'm a, a great fan of your work. I've <laughs> reviewed at least two of your shows and can... I just reread one of them. Uh, your work is really tremendous, and we're all really blessed to have you uh, uh, continue to work. Uh, anyway, I will try to um, see if I can do this. I'm doing this on an iPad. Uh, let's see if I can figure out on. So I let's see here. I'm going to bring up. Whoa! What am I going to do? No, 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 no. no. What do we do now? Here, I'm making you. Great. <laughs> okay, oh. I'm going to share my screen. Right, share content, is that it? Share yes, screen okay. in the green at the bottom, yeah. Okay, it's actually on top on an iPad. Okay. okay, screen, okay, very good. Everything, very good, okay, good. Start broadcast, there we go, and okay. I'm sharing my screen, okay, good. Now, 
let's go over into my uh, and then go back to there we go and here we go and there we go so can you see that yes we can okay very good okay i i have only i have uh, five paintings in the uh, that on my show i'm very pleased thank you very much the first one is called at sinai it is based upon the notion that uh, when we received the Torah at Sinai, effectively both the mountain hovered over us and also, but it was like a chuppah, like it was like a wedding canopy. And so uh, this painting is from 92, showing Menei Yisrael rather happy about receiving the Torah. One figure, if you note in the lower right, actually run away because it must have been quite a terrifying experience. And even some people on the, on the right actually erecting a ladder, maybe trying to ascend heaven. That's one painting. Next painting is uh, Ruth Nomi and or Orpah, again from the book of Ruth. Uh, Nomi approaching, uh, sorry, Ruth approaching Nomi with Orpah on the right. Um, the third painting I've shown is actually called uh, Leading the People. And this is from Exodus 13, 21, in which we are told that a pillar of fire led us through the wilderness as we, as we proceeded uh, during the night, and that's simply an, a, a showing of Moses and Aaron and the children of Israel following them uh, with the pyramids <laughs> behind them. Uh, another painting, Abraham, Sarah, and guests. As you know, three guests, three strangers, three actually angels, came and visited Abraham as he was uh, recovering from uh, his, uh, his self-circumcision uh, and him welcoming him them. The last painting uh, simply is a Jacob's Ladder. Uh, a favorite subject that I've dealt with many, many times. Uh, it is a wonderful subject, not only in terms of a vision of, of man's encounter with God, but also perhaps that being a rather scary vision at that. So uh, those are the paintings I'm showing. Uh, happy that I showed it. Uh, I do want to mention, let's see here, how do I get out of all this? Maybe unshare the screen. How about that? Can we do that? How's that? There we go. Okay, good. All right. Uh, let's see if I can get back into Zoom. I guess so. Very good. Okay, good. How about it? That wasn't so bad. Anyway, um, just one quick pitch. Uh, you know, perhaps everyone knows, I hope you all know the two, at least two large Jewish artists uh, organizations in the United States and, interna and internationally. One is one that I'm involved in called the Jewish Art Salon. Uh, we have over 400 members. We're an international membership. Uh, I encourage you to look us up on JewishArtSalon.org. And then, of course, in California, you have your very own Jewish Artist Initiative. Uh, I'm certain Ruth Weisberg has probably spoken on, on your program. She's part of this exhibition. Uh, a dear, dear old friend. I encourage everyone to uh, keep on looking at Jewish art. And I um, hate to say that, but, you know, it really helps if you buy it, too. Anyway, <laughs> thanks so much for having me. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much, you. Richard. You know, that really isn't enough time by any means to have you speak with us. I'd love to have you back at some point. But one of my hopes in bringing you on here is also how do we keep celebrating, exploring Jewish art? And I'm grateful that you not only shared your art, but also ways that people can remain connected and learning about all the Jewish artists out there. Um, so with that said, why don't we go ahead and open it up and ask Bill and even Richard, any additional questions that you may have? I know somebody, and we'll spend about five more, five to ten more minutes on this for those who are able to to uh, stay with us. Um, I know somebody asked if Bill, if you ever had the chance to photograph the city of Swat. Um, no, I didn't. Um, I actually spent some good time there uh, in the 1960s when I studied at, I did my junior year abroad at Israel uh, for college and used to love to go to Sfat, um, but uh, I didn't get back there when I was photographing. Most of my photographs were largely in Jerusalem. Okay. All right, and if anybody has a comment, um, something they want to express to Bill or a question. Um, Ruth, I see your hand. Here, let me unmute you. Ruth Weisberg. Hold on, you're still muted. 
Uh, now I, I believe yeah. you can yes. hear me. Yes. There you go. Um, just wonderful to have this in-depth uh, experience with Bill Aaron's work, um, who is an artist um, of a great friend, but also an artist, I, a photographer I really admire. And the commitment to, to Jewish themes is profound. And it's wonderful to be joined by Richard McBee, who's also an artist and a person that I admire uh, enormously. That was much too fast. Maybe he can return and, and do a, a more in-depth program. I think that would be terrific. In fact, I, I want to recommend that you go on maybe uh, to do this with more Southern California and national artists. It's, uh, it's you know, it's been a wonderful week and I think people have really gained a new perspective. You know, there's there was a sense years ago, oh, Jewish art, dancing rabbis. You know, <laughs> It was very cliched and people who were serious artists were reluctant to identify themselves. There was a kind of, in the art world, there was a kind of, you know, a universalist uh, aesthetic. You know, you shouldn't identify it profoundly with who you were uh, in, in greater particularity. And it's just so wonderful that we're now in an era in which we can be more pu publicly and uh, communally Jewish and um, people aren't afraid of that anymore or much, much less. And uh, a lot of that has to do with the Jewish Artists Initiative and the uh, Jewish Art Salon, but it also has to do with just a, a general welcoming attitude uh, on the part of, of Jews uh, to being Jewish. Thank you so much, Ruth. I really feel honored. We have so